Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm so delighted that I'm being able to share my thoughts on maps and milestones, how India has been fashioning herself, uh, especially because Uttarakhand is the place and Dehradun is the city where the Survey of India is located. And the Survey of India is the institution where all maps of India have been created. In fact, the Survey of India created the first map of India in 1796. But we shall talk only about maps of India from 1947 to 2019. Uh, you know, this is the map of India in 1947. Uh, 1947 is the time when India became a dominion. It's important to understand that we were the dominion of India. And it's important to mention the dominion of India because the Britishers wanted us to call ourselves dominion of Hindustan. Because the British wanted to have the dominion of Hindustan and the dominion of Pakistan so that it could always be said that the British India has been divided into two. But that's not the view which Sadar Patel and KPS Menon took. We took the view at that point of time and I think a very correct view that we are the successor state to British India. And that's why it was much easier for India to resolve many international agreements and many international treaties. From 1947 to 1950 is a change of great import. As you will see here, there are, there are two colors reflected on the map. And these two colors are the maps of provinces of India, which were the provinces of British India, and the maps like you find Rajputana, and you find Hyderabad, and you find Eastern states. These are the princely states of India. And remember that at that point of time in 1947, 48% of India's population and 52% of India's area was with the princely states. There were 562 princely states in our country, all of varying sizes, varying dimensions, various statuses. And the British had some very nice ways of, you know, putting people in their place. I mean, they gave some people 20, I mean, they gave some princes 21 gun salutes, some were given 19 gun salutes, some were given, you know, uh, shorter salutes. But the important point is that from 1957 to 1950, there is a great change in the map of India. And what is that change? These 562 states, princely states, have disappeared from the map of India because they were reorganized into what we call Part B states or states under the Raj Pramukhs. What happened was that in order to mollify the erstwhile Rajas and Maharajas and Mahadhirajas, we got into something called instrument of accession and the merger agreement by which we gave them some privy purses, some lollipops and told them, all right, we'll make you Raj Pramukh, we'll make you Up Raj Pramukh. And you know, in cases of Rajasthan where there were too many Rajas and they had to be accommodated, so we created new categories. We had Raj Pramukh, we had Up Raj Pramukh, we had Jaisra Up Raj Pramukh, Kanishth Up Raj Pramukh, but we tried to keep all the princely states happy. There were actually at that point of time five states in the country which had 21 gun salutes. Of these, <clears throat> Jammu Kashmir, Hyderabad and Mysore were able to retain their territorial status, but others were merged. And that's a very important moment in Indian history because before that, there were different sets of rules and regulations to manage different people, different sets of people in the country. So that's the big change that happened from 1947 to 1950. When, and if you see the previous map, it said provinces of India, this map says Indian states under the new constitution. It's a very important change. These are Indian states under the new constitution. The next map that I, I mean, there are so many maps. In fact, what happens is that every time the borders, the internal borders, a new state is created or a state gets a new name, the Survey of India prints a new map. But we do not have the time to go through all the maps that have been printed by the Survey of India. But I'll talk about some seminal maps which are very significant. Uh, significant from a very historic standpoint. The next map that I'm going to talk about is the 1952 map. Oh, sorry. Ah, the 1952 map. You see, the 1952 map is important because this is the first map in Hindi of the country. For the first time, 
we produced a map in Hindi in our country, authorized by the Survey of India. And the interesting part about this map is that some names have already started changing. Like for example, uh, you know, Bombay is called Mumbai, the Lakadeep Islands is now called Lakshadweep, and we started Indianizing the names, you know. Earlier it was Mutra, now it becomes Mathura, Ganges become Ganga. Of course, it's a long process. It's a long process, but the process of, of Indianizing names, of getting your own names started here. But what is most important about this map is that for the first time, uh, you know, the word, uh, you know, you, you find here, Tibet is written here, and on top, the, the, I, I'll just go to the next, sorry, 1950, 1952, sorry, yeah. You see, what happens is, the, the change that I want to show you is that in the 1956 map, for the first time, the word China appears on the map of India. I want to take you back one slide where the reference is to Tibet. Now the area that is shown here, now it's very important to understand how our mental imaginations evolve with the cartographic picturization. In 1952, the same area which is shown as Tibet is now being shown as China. And Tibet disappears from the map of India uh, as we move in the year 1956. Now this also shows that how we imagine not only ourselves, but how we imagine a neighborhood. Now you will also find that in the 1956 map, already the country has started changing even more. You got Andhra Pradesh, you got down below, the map is not very visible, but we've got all the four South Indian states ready by this time. Now you see what had happened was that when India became free, or independent as we like to call it, there were four people who had very interesting yet very distinct views about the future of this country. And I'm talking about four greats. I'm talking about Mahatma Gandhi. I'm talking about Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, Sadar Patel, and Joharlal Nehru, stalwarts of the freedom movement. They disagreed on almost everything. And that's the way democracy should be. There should be many ideas and there should be a contest of ideas. But the one thing on which all of them were agreed was that India should be organized on linguistic lines. Because they felt that the way British provinces had been made, those provinces had been made from the view of administrative convenience. And when the language of administration has to be the local language, then it is much better that the language of communication of the state is also the official language of the state. Now, what happened was that immediately after independence, because of the pressures of partition and the, you know, imperative of development, somehow the, the government did not immediately start reorganization of the states on linguistic lines. But in 1952, Poti Sriramalu sat on a hunger strike asking for a separate state for the Telugu-speaking people. And that is when, in 1953, Andhra state was made. Now remember, Andhra state was made in 1953 with Karnul as the capital and that had all the Telugu-speaking districts of the erstwhile Madras Presidency or Madras province. Then in 1956, we had the Andhra state, and as I will show you much later, in 2014, the Andhra Pradesh itself became Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. So it's a very interesting story of how we've been evolving over a period of time. Now the one thing which is not reflected on any map in the country but is very significant is, that at the point of time when everybody was clamoring for linguistic states, two chief ministers, very powerful chief ministers, B.C. Roy, Dr. B.C. Roy from Bengal, and Sri Krishna Sinha from Bihar, they thought, why don't we merge Bengal and Bihar? It was called the Roy Sinha proposals. Uh, initially, there was a lot of enthusiasm about this, but then it petered out for various reasons. I mean, the communists were opposed to it, the UP Congress was opposed to it, and many people felt that this will become the supra-state of the country, which would take away the domination of UP from Indian politics. Now, the reason why B.C. Roy thought about merging Bengal and Bihar was the issue of rehabilitation of those who were being displaced from East Pakistan. Dr. Roy had seen that the rehabilitation of Punjabi refugees in the area which is now Haryana, but was then a part of 
East Punjab. Remember that Punjab at that Punjab at some point of time stretched from Gurgaon right up to right up to you know Peshawar and Dera Ghazi Khan. But even after independence, it stretched from Gurgaon to Atari border on this side. So it was felt that the resettlement of Punjabi refugees had been far more successful in Punjab because it was a common state. And he felt, Dr. B. C. Roy felt that it will be easier to resettle all the uh, people from East Bengal into this much larger region because remember, the fact is that the refugee from Bengal had a very tough time. Some of them were settled, as you are aware, in Pilibhit, some were settled in the Dandakaranya forest, some went to Andamans because Bengal did not have much space. So that was perhaps the reason why he thought of this. Anyway, let's move on. <coughs> we will now talk about the next map. I, this is a <laughs> okay. Uh, in 19, I have skipped the 1960 map because you know TED Talks gives only a limited time. But I'll come to a more significant map. This is the map of 1961. In 1961, India finally had Goa liberated, and you will find that there is a black tape just below Goa. The reason about this black tape is you see that the map had already been printed. And below this black tape, it says Goa Portuguese position. Now, why is it that Goa was liberated only in 1961 and not before? It links to the Berlin Wall. You see, till the establishment of the Berlin Wall, there were two interpretations of the NATO agreement, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. One view was that all the NATO partners will support each other anywhere in the world if they were in conflict with any other country and therefore India could not have afforded to pick up a fight with a NATO power in the 1960s. But during the Berlin Wall, it was clarified that NATO will support each other only as far as the North Atlantic region is concerned. And the moment it was understood by India that NATO will not intervene in Asia, India was able to liberate Goa and that is the end of all foreign jurisdictions in our country because earlier, you see, with the, the settlement with the French in Puducherry, then Pondicherry, now Puducherry, was fairly easy. But that's a very important mark because 1961 meant that there is no further foreign jurisdiction in the country. Incidentally, I must mention that in Goa, the Uniform Civil Court has been in operation from Ever, ever since it was liberated and made part of India. Therefore, uh, Uttarakhand may not be the first state with the UCC. Goa already has the Uniform Civil Court in operation. <clears throat> okay. Now I come to 1963. 1963 map is very important because Nagaland was created as a state. Now, Nagaland is a very small state, one of the smallest states in the country. At that point of time, the population of Nagaland was less than 3 lakhs. The reason why Nagaland was made was that the government of India was very clear that if any ethnic group, any militant group, any underground group is willing to work with the democratic process of this country, respecting the territorial integrity, we shall negotiate. And that was very important. And it also meant that the principle which the SRC had adopted, that a state must be financially viable and administratively large enough, that was rejected in favor of a settlement when an ethnic or a linguistic community would want a state or a political administrative system of its own, as long as the territorial integrity of India is respected. But the making of Nagaland had in itself the making of Mizoram, it had in itself the making of Meghalaya. It had in itself the creation of all the states in the Northeast. So, important thing for us as students of history is to also understand that when a decision is taken on a particular principle, then many decisions on the same principles will be asked for and these principles uh, will obviously lead to a further evolution of thought. I'll skip the formation of Punjab, Haryana, Himachal Pradesh because it's common knowledge and also because once the principle of linguistic uh, settlement of states was done, this had to happen. I will move to, oh, there is a, I will move to uh, another very interesting, a very important development that is the creation of Sikkim in 1975. 
Now, in 1975, <coughs> Sikkim was merged into India. There's a lot of debate about it. You know, there are books that are written that you smashed Sikkim, you did this, you did that. But it is important to understand that the demographics of Sikkim had changed completely even by 1947. You see, Sikkim was a state of the Lepchas initially, was taken over by the Bhutias, but both were Buddhists and both were a monastic order. And they were not very keen on cultivating their own lands. So they brought in workers, agricultural workers from Nepal to cultivate the lands in and around the monasteries. Now because the Bhotias and the Lepchas were a Lamaistic tradition and the Nepalese were a householder tradition. Naturally, the population of Nepalese grew and grew and grew, whereas the population of Bhotias and Lepchas had stabilized. And by 1947, in the state of Sikkim, there were over 60 percent Nepalese who had been denied universal adult franchise. Therefore, the natural propensity of people was to move towards India because India offered much greater freedom. India offered democracy. India offered that every person, every person had the opportunity of becoming a chief minister. Every person had the… And, and if you actually see, after the formation of Sikkim, it has been one of the fastest growing states in the country in terms of GDP, in terms of human empowerment, in terms of organics, many things. You know, so this is what… And, and mind you, we had to bring about constitutional amendments to incorporate or to merge Sikkim with India because the constitution is very clear. India cannot cede an inch of her territory, but India also cannot take any inch of the terri territory. And therefore, an aside, in Teen Bigha, and I must mention here that I was ADM in Kuch Bihar, uh, when, the, when, the, when the white paper on Teen Bigha was being written, written, we have only leased land to Bangladesh. Only leased land for 999 years to Bangladesh at an annual rent of rupee one, which also the president of India was pleased to waive. So technically, that land still belongs to India. We have only leased our land for 999 years at a rent of rupee one, which has been waived. So that is the story of Sikkim's merger with India. And that also shows how different perspectives are written about different situations. Now, in 2000, our state of Uttarakhand was made. In 2000, not only our state was made, we had Uttarakhand, Chhattisgarh, and Jharkhand. Three states were created in our country. And the important point to note about these three states is that there was bipartisan consensus on the creation of these states. The leading political parties of that time, both the Congress and the BJP, the UPA and the NDA, and all their allies, they all agreed that yes, Uttarakhand must be made, Chhattisgarh must be made, and Jharkhand must be made. And this also marked a great change from the earlier belief that not only would we create, not only would, would, would the territorial integrity of India be retained, even the territorial integrity of the constituent units must be retained. So that was a very important change uh, that marked this thing. The next change that happens is the creation of Telangana. Telangana was created in 2014 and in Telangana, the principle that people speaking the same language will always be comfortable with each other that got reversed because it became very clear that if there are major disparities in development, then even if you speak the same language, there can be disagreement and there can be a difference of opinion. The last major change in the country is in the map of 2019, when you find that Ladakh and Jammu Kashmir are created. So when you see, now at the top you have Ladakh as the crest of India. So in one view, Jammu Kashmir is not at the top, it is just next to Ladakh. And you know, sometimes when you find that the area, the reduction, it's a very interesting thing. So uh, it's, it's fascinating and it is interesting because you realize that Ladakh is now the crest of India. And incidentally, in 1948, 
the Ladakh Buddhist Association had made a suggestion that rather than make us a part of Jammu Kashmir, why don't you join us with the Lahol Spiti area, which was then a Punjab hill state. And at that point of time, the thought was that the Lahol, hills, the Lahol Spiti area of, East, of, of Punjab hill states and Teri Ghadwal and Ghadwal should be made into one large Himalayan state as the grand Himalayan state of India. Now, if that had happened, perhaps Uttarakhand would not have happened. But that's a long story. History is all about things that could have happened. History is all about possibilities. History is all about… And the interesting thing about history is that it keeps reinterpreting itself. It keeps reinventing itself. The point is to take an interest in it. And I'm very happy that I got this opportunity to share the perspective about India's history with all of you through her maps and milestones. Thank you.